But I just got word that Beth Moore is sold out. So if you would like to go to Beth Moore, you could like, you know, maybe go stand by the thing with the sign that says, you know, we'll clean house for tickets or something like that. Or, yeah. There will be many more opportunities. I'm sure she will come around again. So we, we last week, because it was Resurrection Sunday, I decided to skip ahead and, and go to the end and talk about his resurrection because there's so much about the new life that just makes everything worth having, makes everything worth giving, and without that new life, Without new life, there is no reason to talk about the story. Without the resurrection, this should just be a dusty old forgotten book. But he lives. And so it left me, because I did that, it left me with a conundrum of, okay, I want to go back and I want to finish up Matthew, but what does that look like? And so, so I, I spent a lot of time in prayer and just trying to, trying to decide what that looks like. And, and as I was looking and as I was reading through, the Lord just said, I want you to talk about the way several different people responded. With the idea of how would you respond? Because really... We all have to respond to Jesus. And as we go out and we, and we go into the community and we talk with people and we share our faith with people, they're going to respond in one of several ways and they're not new ways. They're ways that people have been responding to Jesus for hundreds and, and hundreds of years. And so I want to finish up Matthew today, which, which is weird to say because that means next week I won't be in Matthew and it's, been very, it, it's very comforting to go through a book because you always know what's next and I don't know what's next next week and so I'm sure the Lord will show me this week. It might be something fun like 2 John or something like that. And, and so we're going to come to the conclusion of Matthew. By looking at the way people responded to on his road to the cross. So open up with me if you would in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 26. And, and we're not going to read through everything. We're just going to kind of tell the story. But Jesus has been betrayed by Judas. He's been taken into custody. And the first people that we see dealing with him are the Sanhedrin. And the Sanhedrin rejected Jesus. He was the Messiah. He was the one that was promised. He was the one to come and they rejected him. It says that they looked for false evidence against him. The chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin were looking for false evidence against Jesus so that they could put him to death. And the most amazing thing is that the Jewish judicial system was considered to be one of the most fair systems in the world. As a matter of fact, our judicial system is based on the principles, many of the principles of the judicial system in, that the Jewish people had established by the Lord. Because so many of the principles create a system of fairness. There were several things, though, that weren't adhered to because in the Jewish system, if you gave a false witness against somebody, you received their punishment that they would have gotten. So if you gave false testimony about somebody who was about to be put to death based upon your testimony, you would receive his punishment if it was discovered that you gave a false testimony. But yet, it says that the Sanhedrin, the ones who kept this rule, 
were so caught up in their hatred and so caught up in the moment. That they were looking for false witnesses. They were looking for any reason they could to put him to death. Another part of the judicial system in Jerusalem was that you had to have a one day period between the sentencing and the execution. And during that day, all of the elders would fast. pray to make sure to make sure that their decision was right. And one unique quirk they had was that if the if the courts, if, if all the elders ever decided in unison, unanimously, that someone should be executed, the sentencing was thrown out because they figured it was not a fair trial if every single person believed the person was guilty. But here on this day, it wasn't about fairness. It was about rejection. And so they said, are you the Messiah? As they went through the trial, they couldn't find people who would give false evidence against Jesus that would stick. So finally they asked him, are you the Messiah? Are you the one who was promised to come? And he said, yes. And they went crazy. You would think that a group of people who had waited their whole lives, whose parents had waited their lives, who at generation after generation after generation had waited for this moment, they had waited in anticipation of the day the Messiah would come. When the Messiah finally stood before them and said, Yes, I am the Messiah. That they would fall down and worship Him. But instead they rejected Him. And it says, Then the high priest tore his clothes and said, He has spoken blasphemy. Why do we need any more witnesses? Look now. You have heard the blasphemy. He is claimed to be the Messiah. We must put him to death. Because he can't possibly be right. When we go out into the streets, when we go out to our friends, when we begin to talk with people, one of the ways people will respond is just rejection. I don't believe it. Jesus couldn't be the Messiah. He was just a good teacher. He was this or he was that. But he couldn't possibly be who he said he was. You see, people like that answer. Because they understand that the moment that they claim that Jesus is who he says he is, they now have a responsibility to him. And that responsibility is what Peter understood. Because the next person you see being dealt with immediately is Peter. Peter goes into the, the garden around the area where Jesus is being tried by the Sanhedrin. And someone says, Hey, weren't you with him? I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know the guy. And again, someone says, No, no, you're from Galilee. You must have been with Jesus. Peter says, No, I don't know him. And a third time, Someone makes a connection between Jesus and Peter. And Peter began to call down curses. Began to get angry and shout. 
his denial of knowing Jesus. But Peter was broken by him. Because it says, Then Peter remembered the word Jesus had spoken. Before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. And he went outside and he wept bitterly. Peter's response is completely different than that of the Sanhedrin. We see the Sanhedrin just flat out rejecting who he is. And Peter, having rejected him, saying, I don't know him, was broken. Because he did know who Jesus was and he understood who Jesus was. And what I love most about Peter's response is Peter's response shows a genuineness and understanding who Jesus is and who we are in relation to him. Peter understood not only that Jesus was the Messiah, but that Jesus was holy and pure. And he realized he wasn't. That's why I love that word out there, grace. It's one of my favorite words. And one I try to apply in every area of my life. Because grace is what's given when it's not deserved. Grace is what's given when we haven't earned something, when we need something we can't possibly attain. God says, I'm going to give you grace. I'm going to give you what you don't deserve and what you can't get for yourself. And Peter's response is beautiful in that it is a pure understanding of grace. Peter wept because he realized that he was unworthy of who Jesus was. Peter wept because he realized that he would never be that good. That he could never be as beautiful as Jesus. And he denied knowing him. See, what's powerful about that to me is that we all stumble. We all have those moments where we're going through life and we got this idea of what the day is going to look like and then one little hiccup comes and it shakes us and, and everything that we try to hide comes out. And we create a disaster. And then we look at Jesus. And we throw our hands, our face in our hands, and we just think, wow. How could I still be that way? Why do those days still happen? And the Lord pours grace and says, let's keep going. And I love that because as I look around the room, I see people just like me. People who need grace every day in their life. People who need someone to just say, yeah, we'll just forget that moment now. moving forward. See, that's what Judas needed. Judas left him. And I know that Judas betrayed him. But you know, when he did, he saw that Jesus was condemned. Jesus didn't want Jesus. Judas didn't want him to be condemned. He wanted him 
<coughs> to exert his authority. He wanted him to be the Messiah that they thought was coming, that was going to reign and to rule. But instead, it says he was seized with remorse. He was in the same place that I think Peter was. Feeling the same depth of sorrow. Feeling the bitterness of the mistakes that he had made. But instead of Instead of realizing there's forgiveness, it says that Judas went and he hanged himself. And I think having Judas' story next to Peter's story is important because I don't think Judas' story had to end the way that it did. Yet Jesus said, You know, it is better for that person who betrays me to have not been born. I think Jesus said that because he knew how Judas would end. Not because it had to end that way. And I just think, I mean, what if, what if instead of going to the Sanhedrin and throwing the money at them and leaving and going to a field alone, Judas had went and found Jesus and fell at his feet. And what? <coughs> you know, our society makes this big deal about, well, you know, when when you're following Jesus right, you feel guilty. As if somehow We shouldn't sometimes feel guilty over the things that we do. It's a, uh, society makes a big deal about that because society wants to live in a world that is free from the constraints of being, of having someone explain that there are some things that are not healthy for you to do. But we understand that in life and so many things that we do. I'm sure that you would agree with me, driving in the middle of the night without your headlights on is an unhealthy thing to do. Eating ice cream all day long is an unhealthy thing to do. But you know what? Lying is an unhealthy thing to do. Holding anger is an unhealthy thing to do. I think so often in society when we begin talking about Jesus, we run into people that are like Judas. They understand the depth of the things that they've done wrong. They understand the mistakes that they've made in life. They understand how who they are has brought them to the place that they're at. And they drown their sorrows in alcohol or in drugs, trying to forget everything about the mistakes that they've made. Last Sunday, Natalie and I went and saw I Can Only Imagine. And that picture describes Bart Millard's death. Could not deal with the mistakes that he had made. And so he left Jesus. As if somehow Jesus isn't there ready to wrap his arms around us. 
And I would have loved for the story of Judas to have gone differently. I would have loved for Judas to have crawled to Jesus' feet and said, I'm sorry. Because I think there would have been a different response. And I think there would have been a beautiful moment of grace. Because Jesus had to go to the cross. But Judas, Judas didn't have to be eternally separated from him. From Judas, it goes on to Pilate. And Pilate was a guy who just couldn't be bothered. Pilate's a guy who they, the Sanhedrin, they brought Jesus before Pilate. And they did it first thing in the morning. As soon as the sun came up, they probably had Pilate woken out of bed. And they brought him before Jesus. They wouldn't even enter Pilate's house because they didn't want to be defiled so that they could eat Passover that evening. And Pilate was a man who just couldn't be bothered, didn't want to be bothered. And I can just see it in Pilate's expression as, as they bring Jesus before him and they're like, Jesus is claiming to be the king of the Jews. And Pilate's looking at Jesus. And he says, are you the king of the Jews? Really? Please tell me no so I can go back to breakfast. Please tell me something, because I just really can't be bothered with this right now, you crazy Jewish people. And really what we see in Pilate is someone who just didn't want to be bothered at all with the trouble of who he was. And we encounter a lot of people, especially in the way society is now, we go out and we begin to talk about Jesus, and there's just a lot of people, you know what, I can't be bothered with who Jesus is. I don't really care. Whatever. I just don't want to be bothered. And that's the way Pilate was. Pilate's like, you know what? Whatever I can do to not have to deal with who Jesus is, that's what we're going to do today. Pilate went out to them and said, you know what? I don't see anything. I see nothing. There is nothing wrong with this guy. And they shouted all the more, crucify him. So Pilate had him whipped and beaten until he almost couldn't be recognized. And brought him out and said, now are you happy? And they said, no. And so Pilate said, fine, I'm going to wash my hands of this man. And they said probably the worst thing that could ever be said in response. Let his blood be on us and upon our children. Pilate couldn't be bothered. He didn't care. Pilate just liked his nice, cushy, cushy job. What he didn't like was having to deal with the Jewish people. He probably liked it less than Moses did. Because they were difficult and obstinate. There are two other people, two other groups, one group and one person. There's a group of soldiers that hated him. The Sanhedrin rejected him because they didn't want him to be the Messiah. Pilate just could care less. But the soldiers hated him. They spit on him. They mocked him. They beat him. And you'll find those people you will find people that genuinely hate you because of the name of Jesus in your life. You'll find people that hate you because of how you live. Because you live by a set of standards that are outside of you. Because you live 
by a code and you try to conduct yourself in a certain manner, there will be people that hate you. And they will come against you whenever they can. And you're going to think, man, all I did was mention the name of Jesus. But we see it in society. Our kids can bring the Quran to school if they want to. They can bring the writings of Buddha to school if they want to. And Confucius. But if they bring the writings of Jesus to school, there is an uproar. And the reason is, is because one book has power and the others don't. And everyone understands it and everyone knows it and they want nothing to do with that power. They hate that power. They despise that power. They hate the light that comes with it. And they hate the light that is a part of anyone who is a part of it. So they hated him. And there's one last man, and his name is Joseph. After Jesus is placed on the cross, after he paid the price, for our sin. One of those men who was a part of the sin by the name of Joseph came and took his body and laid his body in a tomb that was made for him. And he said, I want, I want my Messiah to have this. And absolutely there were days where Joseph was like Peter and Peter like Joseph. Because that's part of the ride of being with Jesus. But how you respond to Jesus is what everyone has to do. How are you going to respond to Jesus is a question that everyone has to answer. How would you respond? How do you respond today to Jesus? Absolutely, there are days like that I'm Peter. There are days I'm Joseph. I hate to say it, there are days I'm Pilate. I just don't want to be bothered. There have been days where I've been the soldiers and I've just been angry and mad at God. There are days I'm angry at His plan for my life. I'm angry at the things He's had me do. I'm angry for this. I'm angry for that. And I just want to be like the soldiers and take it out of And then after I do that, I'm Peter again. Weeping bitterly. So moved by my humanness. How do you respond to Jesus? And really, that's the question we have for those that we know. How are you going to respond? called to love. Love Him with our heart, mind, and soul. And as we love Him, we have those moments that we're like Peter, and that's why that word grace is so important. Because everyone around us needs it. Everyone around us needs as much of it as we do. And we're called to give it. We love. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, 
Lord, we come before you today and we we wrestle with that question. How do you respond to Jesus? And Lord, I'm ashamed to say that I'm not always Joseph. But Lord, I praise you for the moments that I'm like Peter. And you wrap your arms around me. And you walk me back to where I'm supposed to be. Father, may we enjoy your arms of grace. 